parents to talk to your kids about the video we saw about the first Peter Church. I want to thank you all for praying for my dad. He uh, hopefully is going home Tuesday. I got down there, he was in the hospital still, and uh, I think on Thursday, I got there on Monday, and on Thursday we went to the nursing home for rehab, and uh, so he's been there ever since. And, uh, not willing to be there at all. But uh, his stubbornness is a good thing because it made him work really hard to get out of there. So appreciate your prayers. I saw uh, last week's message on YouTube, and Jeff did a great job, I thought. Amen. And, uh, looked like it was a good attendance as well. So uh, and the thing I noticed was the, the difference between the last time Jeff spoke. You know, he this time he had his thoughts together. He was able to get them out there good, and uh, just God's really blessed him. And uh, I, I didn't see Jim and Judy on the video, but. Uh, I think, I think you all are probably glad to see them too. Today we're in Acts chapter 7. If you know anything about Acts 7, it's often called Stephen's defense. But I think it really ought to be called Stephen's offense. <laughs> because he really takes it to these guys uh, about where they ought to be and, and what has happened in the past. And uh, so we're going to look at this with that in mind. That is, this is Stephen's offense rather than his defense. I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 8. The high priest said, Are these things so? And he, meaning Stephen, said, Hear me, brethren and fathers. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. And said to him, Leave your country and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. Then he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. From there, after his father died, God had him move to this country, that's Israel, in which you are now living. But he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot of ground. And yet, even when he had no child, he promised that he would give him, give it to him as a possession and to his descendants after him. But God spoke to the, in this effect that his descendants would be aliens in a foreign land and that they would be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. And whatever nation to whom they will be in bondage, I myself will judge, said God. And after that, they will come out and serve me in this place. And he gave him this covenant of circumcision. So Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the twelve patriarchs. Stephen's discourse here that we have is the longest speech in the book of Acts. His speech is longer than any that Paul gave, any that Peter gave. And so it's important that we, I think, take a look at it. So we're going to do that in the next few weeks. We're going to, I've titled this series of messages, The Heroes in Acts chapter 7. So we're going to look at some of the key figures that Stephen talks about here as he's giving his offense before this, this council made up of these Jewish leaders and the Jewish nation. As a result of Stephen's speech, he was stoned to death. And as a result of, of that, persecution of Christians uh, began to spread. And the Christians were scattered. And, you know, when you think of that, that that's, that's bad. But no, it's good. <laughs> because everywhere the Christians were scattered to, they didn't give up their faith. They began to preach their faith and to share their faith. And so the persecution that resulted in Stephen's stoning here was a good thing. And, you know, it, it's one of the best examples we could look at of Romans 8, 28. That even though bad things were happening, 
God brought good out of it as the church began to, to spread. In chapter 6, charges were brought against Stephen and he was, it says, dragged before the council. Verses 11 through 15. This council was made up of Pharisees and Sadducees and religious leaders of the Jewish nation. So that's who he was giving this offense to, or defense if you want to think of it that way. So what he does, he goes back in Jewish history and he talks about people who were important to the Jewish nation. And Abraham is the one he begins with. The Jewish people took great pride in being able to recite their own history. And, you know, it, it's, it's great to be able to recite your history, but if you can just recite it and you don't really remember what it all meant, it, it doesn't mean a whole lot. Stephen was reminding them of the history they were able to recite, but he was telling them what it all meant, and they had forgotten some of that. A hero answers God's call. And Abraham did that. He lived in Mesopotamia, which was Ur of the Chaldees, near the Persian Gulf that we know of today. He was between the Tigris and Euphrates River, somewhere there. God called to Abraham to leave his country, the country he knew, to go somewhere else. To the land which he would show him. I think probably we would all agree today that if we were if we're gonna go somewhere, we want to know where it is we're going before we start out going. That wasn't the case with Abraham. He was willing to go to some place God hadn't even told him where it was yet. That's faith right there. In fact, Hebrews eleven eight, commenting on this, says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called by God, obeyed going out to a place not really knowing where he was going. That's real faith. How many of you would sign a blank check and let God fill in the amount? Basically, that's what Abraham is doing here. Abraham and the people around her were living in an idolatrous culture. The people actually there in Ur worshipped many gods. The most prominent one was worshipping the moon. And it's interesting, I think, that on a lot of the, uh, the Arab countries and, and countries in, in that region today, they even have a crescent moon on their flag, some of them. Well, it goes back to this God, which they were worshiping even way back as far as Abraham's day. At 3 a.m., one cold morning, a missionary candidate walked into the office for a scheduled interview of the mission board that he was going to go with to a foreign country. He waited from 3 a.m. to 8 a.m. for a person who was examining his credentials and, and things. Five hours he waited. Finally, when the examiner arrived at 8 a.m., the examiner said, Let us begin. First, please spell Baker. B-A-K-E-R. He said. Yeah, that spelled that. Very good. Now, let's see how you are with figures. How much is twice two? Well, the candidate said four. Very good, again, the examiner said. I'll recommend you to the board tomorrow that you be appointed. You've passed the test. Now, that sounds like an awful weird test, right? For a missionary candidate? <laughs> but that's not the end of the story. The next day, at the board meeting, the examiner spoke highly of the applicant. He said, 
He has all the qualifications of a missionary. Let me explain. First, I tested him on self-denial. I told him to be at my office at 3 in the morning. He was on time. He left a warm bed and came out into the cold without a word of complaint. And second, I tried, out him, tried him out on punctuality. He appeared on time, and that was a good thing. And thirdly, I examined him on patience. I made him wait five hours to see me. After telling him to come at three, I didn't show up till eight. And fourth, I tested him on his temper. He failed to show any signs of anger at all. He didn't even question my delay. And fifth, I tried him in his humility. I asked him questions that even a child could do. Spelling Baker and two times two. He showed no offense at those easy questions. He meets the requirements and will make a great missionary that we need on the table. That comes from 7,700 7, illustrations. It points out, I think, the kind of person Abraham was. And he was, he was willing to go. He was willing to do whatever God said without any question at all. Abraham obeyed God. And that's the mark of a hero. When God says something, you do it. A hero not only answers God's call, but a hero also keeps the faith. God promised Abraham that he would be the father of a great nation, and that he would have descendants that were as numerous as the sand on the seashore. There was only one problem. He didn't have any children yet. And God promised him that. So how is God going to fulfill that promise without a child? Well, when, when Abraham was, was 100 and Sarah was 90, God gave him a child. And in doing so, God was emphasizing a point. That this was of God. Because someone 100 years old and 90 years old can't have children. But God can bring about a child, even people older than that, if he wants to. And he did. And Abraham and Sarah. Who was this Abraham that we're talking about? Who was this Abraham that Stephen began his defense, his offense with? Well, there's a semi-nomadic shepherd whom God revealed himself and made promises to, who God had entered into a covenant with, and God promised him many children, and a land that would be an inheritance, not to him, but to his future children. Put yourself in Abraham's sandals. God's promising you, you these things. You see no way it's going to happen. Abraham believed in these promises. And the scripture says he was counted as righteous by God. Because he believed God. Even though he didn't have hardly any proof. Of what God was saying, he believed God would somehow bring him to me. Ultimately, all of these promises were fulfilled in one person, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Long, long after Abraham was gone. And we have to understand something here, I think. We expect God to act now. But God may be acting way on down the line. We won't even be around when he does. We can't forget that. We 
We are Abraham's spiritual children today. Promise God made to Abraham, he kept. And we're the beneficiaries of, beneficiaries of that. Abraham was born in Ur. He moved to Haran with his father, Terah. At God's call, he traveled to Canaan, the land of Israel, and lived for a while in various localities. From the scriptures, we know he lived in Shechem and Hebron and Bethel in the Negev Desert, and he sojourned for a while in Egypt and in Gerar. Genesis records to us that he had a band of, of armed men who rescued his nephew Lot at Sodom and Gomorrah. Scripture also tells us that he paid tithes to Melchizedek, king of Jerusalem. And it also tells us he entertained angels. This man Abraham was quite a guy. He was a hero. But the thing that makes him a hero more than anything else is obedience to what God said. He wasn't a perfect man. Because at some point he believed that maybe God meant for him to take the bull by the horns. <laughs> and so he, he takes Sarah's handmaiden, Hagar, and has a child through her, thinking maybe that's the way God's going to keep this promise to me. But it wasn't. So he wasn't a perfect man at all. But God still saw his faith, his obedience, and blessed him. He gave them a child when they were 190. His devotion and faith to God was such that he was willing to do something God said to do that we would think is so horrible. The killing of his own son. The son that God was going to keep all these promises with. Isaac. God blessed him because he obeyed even in that instance. God said to take your son Isaac up on the mountain and sacrifice him. Can you imagine what mm -hmm. must have been going through Abraham's head, mm -hmm. his mind? God, how can you ask me to do that? Mm -hmm. But as God always does, he provides a way of escape. He provides an answer. He provided a ram stuck in the bush for the sacrifice, just as the knife was about to come down on his son. I don't know if God tests you that way sometimes, but he could, just to see if you're going to be obedient to what he said. We know that Abraham grew, he grew wealthy, he married again after Sarah's death. He lived to be 175 years old. Abraham realized where he came from. He realized how important God was in his life. And I imagine after that day on Mount Moriah, he had that image permanently in his mind of almost sacrificing his own son. I want you to think as we close out this message. What is your most valuable possession? I mean, what means more to you than anything else? If God told you Give that possession up. Would you do it? What would you be willing to sacrifice to God if, that, if God asked you to sacrifice that most prized possession that you have? Would you be willing to do it? 
Well, Abraham was. Because he drew a line, a line in the sand. He was going to always obey God as best he could. And you and I need to draw a line in the sand too. We're going to obey God no matter what. If it means giving up the thing that's most valuable to us. Abraham took Isaac up on the Mount Moriah, which is Jerusalem. The Dome of the Rock sits there now, probably where that happened. Stephen began his defense with this particular guy, Abraham, for a reason. You see, Abraham was the father of the Jewish nation. Abraham was also a shadow of Christ. A lot of similarities between Abraham and Christ. They were both obedient. Abraham almost sacrificed his son on the altar just before God invited a ram. God provided His Son as our sacrifice on the cross. Just what we needed for salvation. Isaac, in a sense, was resurrected from the dead. Just before that knife killed him, there was a ram in a bush. In a sense, he was resurrected from death. Just like Jesus Christ rose three days later from that tomb. I think Stephen started out talking about Abraham because Abraham was a real hero. And he knew that these Jewish leaders would understand who Abraham was to them. Because actual, actually they, they understood he was the father of their nation. They didn't understand all the things that he did and why he was obedient. I think we can learn much from Abraham. Even much more than Stephen tells us here. We can go to the book of Hebrews. Because it tells us several things about Abraham that Stephen didn't necessarily mention. But one he did, verse 8 of Hebrews chapter 11, it says Abraham obeyed God when he called him. We read that here in Acts chapter 7. It also says in verses 9 and 10, By faith Abraham lived as a stranger as he looked for that heavenly city. You see, there was more on Abraham's mind than just getting through this life here on earth. He was looking for someplace better. A heavenly city. The Hebrew writer says, we need to look beyond this life to that heavenly city too. In Hebrews 11 verse 17 it says Abraham obeyed God when he was tested to sacrifice his own son. Stephen mentions that. And then in verse 19 of Hebrews 11 it says Abraham believed God was able to to even raise the dead. Well, that's, that's almost unbelievable that Abraham, way back in the Old Testament in the book of Genesis, had that understanding that even God could raise the dead. How about you? Is God calling you? Is He asking you to obey? Is he asking you to do something that you think is not possible? God, all things are possible. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. Yes. So don't, don't slump off something God's asking you to do. Because he won't ask you to do something without giving you the power to do it. Stand by thank you to help you. What will your answer be when God calls you? Well, he has called you. He's called you to serve him your talents, with your abilities, with your whole heart? Are you doing that? 
We're going to sing an invitation today. We need you to think about Abraham. And Stephen talked about Abraham as an offense. He was trying to get these Jewish people who knew who Abraham was to realize how important it was to obey God. They had forgotten that part of it. They were willing to say, yeah, we're children of Israel, but they weren't willing to do what God said to do. How about you? Are you willing to do what God says? Let's, let's stand, and if you need to make a decision today of any kind, when you come.